Okay, so we're now recording. Uh, go back to the lobby and it's now 10.30, so I'll start meeting all. So it'll take a couple of minutes, uh, Robin, sure. to uh, bring everybody in. But uh, Oh, Julian on. Barker's on. Oh, dear. Right. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, take that slide out about Julian. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, you've, been very, you've been rude to Julian many times. It's, it's a, I'm, sure, it's I'm sure he's used to it. Occupational sure. hazard of being working at the DWP, having Robin Ellison being rude to you. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Right, so I'm going to right. start admitting all. Uh, here we go. Good morning, Ian. Good morning, Bobby. Morning. Good morning, morning, Julian. Good morning, Barry. Good morning, Good morning Derek. Morning. Morning in. If you've just joined, if you could, uh, well, number one, I hope you all had fantastic bank holiday weekends. Um, <laughs> Henry, you seem to be sharing the screen twice, Henry, by the way. So if you could uh, X out of that, then um, we're all seeing double. There you go. Uh, oh, he's just left. There you go. Um, morning, Shay. Um, morning, Michael. Uh, so Henry will be coming back in on that one, which is good. If you've just joined, if you could mute, that would be fantastic. Um, morning, Darren. Uh, Bob, if you could mute, that would be good. Thanks. Uh, so, some more joining now. Uh, Shay, can you mute as well? Is, is that possible? Or do you want me to mute for you, Shay? Or Sherry. Um, Steve, could you mute for me? Because I'm muted on my side, but it's not showing. Ah, uh, okay. Boom. There we go. Okay, fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, it's now 10.32. Um, Henry, we have you back on board. Um, do you want to share the slides, Henry? Get the slideshow up, and then, uh, then we can make a start. Oh, more people joining. Hang on. Let's view the lobby. Da, 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 da. Morning, Leslie. Morning, Wilson. If you could mute, that'd be great. Thanks very much. That's good. Okay. Uh, and Jeff. Morning, Jeff. Morning, Phil. There we go. A few late flights last night, I guess, because of air traffic control. So a few late joiners. So uh, Phil, you look like a pilot with that with that headset on. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it is a flight simulator. <laughs> I bet a few people wish I was. Oh, yeah, I bet you're right. Yeah. Can anybody fly a plane? There you go. So uh, right, let's just see how we go. There we go. Let's see if we can get uh, that going. Um, Admit apologies 1033. Uh, as I say, if you've just joined, if you could mute, that'd be fantastic. Uh, I think we've lost Henry Robin for some reason, but there we oh, go. He'll, so he'll never know. He'll, he'll be back. He'll be back. He'll be back. Shall we start? Uh, anyway, how do you feel? Yeah, I think that's a good that's a, that's a good idea. Okay. I think we should start with a few uh, with a few introductions. Okay. Well, so let me just morning. Bring, uh, well, thanks, yeah, Steve. Um, yep. Not everybody will know that Steve is suffering from COVID or post COVID at the moment. So let's all wish him a rapid recovery. He's, he's sacrificing his health for us, I know, which we I know. all appreciate. I'm, I'm, dripping. Uh, I'm dripping. Okay, I'll start. And Henry's got some slides as and when he comes back. But before we get started, um, I just thought I'd make a couple of preliminary remarks. And um, you should all feel free to chip in, complain, argue, com uh, make comments as we go along. It's not supposed to be an hour lecture. That's not what it's about. Um, and a couple of preliminaries. First of all, we've only got an hour and we can all rant on this for, for, for uh, uh, forever. Second of all, we're not mentioning individual names of this. This is a, a systemic uh, critique rather than individual criticism of any human being involved in regulation. Thirdly, looking at the screen, most of us are too young to remember the film Life of Brian, which is getting on a bit through 30, 40 years ago now. Mm -hmm. But it, this obviously is a quote from the Life of Brian right. about the Romans. And the question is, uh, for the younger members of our group, uh, the complaint was that the Romans were controlling things and they hadn't actually done anything. But the people, as we know, Romans had done a few things. I'd like to argue through this conversation that maybe TPR aren't quite the Romans. Uh, 
finally, just another preliminary remark, and that is um, this looks like an attack on the pension regulator, which it kind of is. Uh, <laughs> but my work, my day to day work is looking at regulation generally. Um, and I'm looking at lots of different regulators, some of which are very uh, effective, most of which are suboptimal. And the argument is that TPR is one of those suboptimal things. So it's not just I'm not looking just at TPR, but TPR is obviously for most of us the, the main regulator that we're interested in. Uh, Chatham House rule applies, uh, but lots of other things going wrong as well. Henry, I don't know if you're around yet. Um, I, I am around. Yeah. Shall we see if we can get the, the second I'm slide I'm trying up? to get the slides up. I okay. had them up and, yeah, and I then I had a glitch. As I this tried technology to is a real pain. Not to worry. Let's just look at why the TPR is there. I thought we'd, we'd look at the point of the TPR, why it was invented in the first place, and then explore later on uh, what are the costs and what are the benefits. Um, can we have the next slide uh, when you've got a moment, uh, Henry? Thanks. Uh, and then we'd look at some of the outcomes that are happening at the moment, some of the unintended consequences. And I know there's a question already been submitted about LDI, which is one of the consequences, obviously, of TPR. And then some positive news about what we could do with a decent TPR if we had the opportunity to reform it. Um, so uh, that's the background. Next slide, please, um, Henry. If we could. Thanks. Um, the, the way that the, uh, and the final thing I want to talk about was the tone of TPR. And this slide here is a is a, a takeoff of a TPR slide which is threatening people. It's saying, good employers, don't have me work. We will find out. In other words, it's a threat to us, you and me, um, that if we don't comply with the regulator, they'll give us a rough time. Modern regulators like the CAA and a few others attempt to reform uh, trade practice through love and affection uh, rather than through fear. Uh, and I wanted to explore if the change in tone of TPR might help us all and save us a lot of money as well at the same time. Next slide, please, uh, Henry. Thanks. Uh, again, most of us are too young to remember Maxwell. He's getting on for 30 odd years ago now, although his daughter's um, uh, been in the news more recently. And the reason TPR was invented, which is the third or fourth regulator in a succession of regulators, uh, was following Maxwell and uh, a report, as we know, by mm. Professor Good, saying that there should be something in place uh, better to protect members than the previous regulator. Now I have to declare an interest because I was on a board of a previous regulator called the Occupational Pensions Board um, and uh, we were suboptimal as well, uh, no excuse for that, and if we have time we could talk about a few anecdotes about what happened with OPB uh, compared with what's happening with TPR. But what's it there for? Well most regulators are not there to do a job to, for you and me, they're there to do a job to um, create a firebreak for government and government departments. Um, so I know we have some guests and um, friends from DWP. It helps DWP and the minister and the secretary of state to have a regulator that if things go wrong, you can point the finger at the regulator and say it's the regulator's job to fix this. It's not my fault, uh, says the minister in parliament. And that's its main job. Uh, its secondary job, I'll just put them down, uh, is to protect the PPF, which the PPF doesn't really want it to at the moment. It thinks it can protect itself. Uh, the main function from the public's point of view is that it protects members' outcomes. And we'll come and see in a minute why it's not doing that. Uh, one of the question marks is, uh, what I want to talk about is, is what they call regulatory creep. It's expanding its brief and its remit beyond whatever it was intended to do. And one of the things it's doing at the moment is trying to improve scheme schemes and benefits. Uh, and that's really what it was not invented for. It was invented to make sure that members were protected against fraud, which is the Maxwell problem, um, and possibly abuse by employers, which was a kind of secondary issue, and not to change the retirement income system. Now, I just want to mention how, how it's grown. When it was invented about 15-ish years ago, um, there were roughly, I think, about 20 or 30 staff and had a budget of about 10 million. That was the, the business budget. It's now a budget of 100 million, and it's got a staff of about a thousand and growing. Uh, and the question is, for that kind of money and that kind of overhead, uh, it, could we do better? And secondly, is it actually working? Next slide, please. OK, uh, I just thought it's quite amusing to know that T or bits of TPR are about to go on strike. Uh, 
for more money. And there was a famous strike in Israel many years ago when the doctors went on strike and the, the uh, death rate collapsed. <laughs> uh, and the question is, if the TPR goes on strike, uh, will things improve for members? That's kind of a cheap joke. But what does TPR do at the moment? And most of the thing at the moment is it's collecting bits of paper or making sure that we, you and me, fill in bits of paper and complete bits of paper. Uh, anybody who's been to trustee meetings in the last four or five years will testify to the fantastic growth and the size of the packs that <laughs> members have to look at. Um, and that's why iPads have become useful and so forth to try and save the planet. But there's a huge amount of paper. And what we're not sure is whether this paper is actually what it is that's protecting members. Secondly, it collects information, just a, a little whinge or perhaps a big whinge. Uh, TPR collects information, PPF collects information, HMRC collects information about pension schemes. It would be a great saving in effort if we could all fill in one form once a year uh, rather than three sets of bits of information, all slightly different uh, in different ways. Uh, but the base information is the same. And uh, I can't see any um, effort by uh, the pension record and the others to get together to try and simplify and make easier our lives, which is really what it should be about. Thirdly, is it protecting members? It's there to protect members. And it's really hard to see for the for the 100 million that it's spending. Oh, sorry, just one point. Um, for every, the general rule of thumb in regulation is that every pound spent by a regulator uh, involves the spending of 20 pounds by the regulated. So we're spending around, and that's a very rough rule of thumb, nobody can prove it one way or the other, but it seems about right. So we're spending about two billion a year to protect scheme members. And there's no evidence that actually members have been protected as a consequence of all this fantastic effort and paperwork. The next blob is to do with regulatory creep, and this is a theme that's, that's running throughout this, uh, this note, which is that every time the regulator seems to have something under control, it thinks of something new to do. And I've just mentioned three or four, and there's many others we can touch on. But diversity is suddenly got decided that it thinks trustees would, be, would benefit from, and there's no objection to it, but it's not a role of a regulator. The argument is that it's not a regulator's job to ensure this. ESG, anybody who's been following the FT um, coverage of this in the last six months will see that there are fashions, fashions in ESG um, which are really hard for a regulator to apply or enforce. It should really get off, get its tanks off the grass and let ESG develop naturally. Uh, it's looking at whether trustees are capable, and that's kind of more than it should be doing. And it's looking at the structure of the industry. Consolidation has become an issue. And although consolidation may be a good thing or a bad thing, it's not really for a regulator to decide how many providers there should be just to make its life easier. So what it does, it interferes in what you and I do day to day. Now, I think we could probably live with that if we felt it was adding value. And as you know, we're all supposed to look at value for money, and all these other things in our own uh, backyard. But there's no evidence at all that's available that shows that what TPR and similar regulators for that matter are doing is value for money or is improving outcomes for members. Let's just look at the next slide, Henry, if we may. By the way, let's stop here. Any points, questions, comments, complaints, issues, notes? <laughs> now, I think there's some more people wanting to join. So uh, there's about 40 of us on the, on the call. Is we, have, we have one request to see if the slides can be shared at the end. Yeah, no, of course, absolutely. That's uh, fine. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah Semi-public domain, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, there's one comment, I think, from uh, John Mather. I don't know if you're on the call, John, you there? Um, about, <laughs> and I want to come on to his your point, which is um, the, the impact of the pension regulator on investments and investment performance. Anyway, this slide uh, tries to look at what the evidence, if any, there is about benefits as opposed to harms or in comparison to harms. And John Mother's point is, uh, which I'm very sympathetic to, is that um, the LDI um, process um, theoretically has wiped out 15 years ago. I'm not sure I quite agree with the numbers, uh, but, but it has been an expense for lots of pension schemes. Uh, and the argument is that the pensions regulator has encouraged or persuaded or admonished pension schemes to move to what, what they call, uh, quote, risk-free, unquote, mm -hmm. investments, i.e. a fixed income of one version or another, rather than uh, growth funds such as uh, equities and alternatives. 
And I've been in the middle of several of these conversations with the regulator. And we have attempted to draw, to keep a balance between what they want and what we think is the right thing to do for members. And it's clearly been an absurd thing for members for many years to invest in government securities and fixed income for all the reasons that most of us on the call understand. Um, there's one or two people think it's a very good thing. Um, but most, most, I would think the preponderance of the industry is, is, has been against uh, regulators' investment strategy and policy. Um, and the reason regulators want us to do this is not for the benefit of members, really, although it's argued that it is. It's for the benefit of the regulator. So if things go wrong, the regulators can say, well, it's all in fixed income, that's fine, if the market's collapsed. But if things go right, it gets no credit. So there's an asymmetry of interest for regulators in being uh, perverse. Uh, and we need to to come on to that in a moment. So the costs, let's just go through the bullet points here. The, the costs are really pretty high. Uh, um, we have to hire lawyers and accountants and actuaries and all these kind of people, investment consultants and covenant advisors, complete waste of money, really. The outcomes have not been improved. Uh, it is true that assets in pension funds have risen, but that's not to do with the, only partly to do with the regulators, it's mostly to do with the changes in the markets. Uh, and by and large, we've been investing in suboptimal investments. So the cost to UK industry has been phenomenal. I can't, nobody knows the numbers, but you can invent them. They are in the hundreds of billions. And the question yeah. is, would there be, would there have been a more appropriate use of capital uh, than sticking it in bonds in a pension fund? It just seems as perverse and absurd. Compliance costs for trustees have been very high. I won't spend time on that. Sheer volume of materials we've talked on. The problem that many have, uh, there's a wonderful article in The Spectator this week by a guy called Rory Sutherland, who runs an, an, advert, an, ad, um, an advertising agency. And he, he talks about something which I never heard of before, which I think is really, really brilliant. He calls it, or he's stolen it from what they call Pornell's Iron Law of Bureaucracy. Forgive me for a moment. And I'll just quote his, his uh, it's a shorter quote from, than he uses, but it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant quote. He says, in any bureaucracy, you can look at uh, the pension regulator or the FCA or the General Medical Council, whatever bureaucracy you want to look at. In any bureaucracy, the people devoted to the benefit of the bureaucracy always get in control. And those dedicated to the goals that the bureaucracy is supposed to accomplish have less and less influence or are eliminated entirely. Now, what he's saying is that the bureaucracy has a life of its own just to justify its own existence. And what's interesting about TPR, amongst many other regulators, is that most regulators, with some exceptions, have a relatively short shelf life. Most of the previous pension regulators have lasted 10, 15 years or thereabouts. And the pensions regulator is coming up to its, to its term. It's, get, it's been knocking on for around 15 years. The sheer volume of stuff on its website is overwhelming. And it seems to be thinking of new things to do day by day, rather than doing its main job, which is protecting members. And as we can see from the scams history in the last uh, few months, it's absolutely not doing that. And if we wanted to discuss how we might, what it might do in relation to scams, uh, I'd love to spend a little time on that. Uh, and there is, um, sorry, the unintended consequence of what the regulators have been doing in the last few years have been uh, uh, have been harmed. So in other, words, in other words, members have been badly affected by what the regulators have been doing. And pension schemes and employers have been badly affected by its investment policy. Uh, I'm nearly done in my in my shtick. Any comments, guys? Any points anybody wants to raise? Any issue? Okay, I'll press on then. So what are the adverse consequences? Thanks, uh, Henry. Well, uh, just look at the bureaucracy, the amount of paperwork we've mentioned at Northampton, but it is becoming absurd. Uh, and it looks at things like value for money, which it can't really justify. Most of these are box ticking things. Uh, value at risk, I've had to do value at risk exercises for no particular reason I can see. It doesn't really apply to pension schemes in the same way as it applies to financial services companies. Um, covenant reviews, we spend an enormous amount of money, time and effort on covenant reviews, which are utterly pointless as far as I can see. If you look at the website, which is not a good example of a website, the sheer volume of stuff on there is phenomenal and it's really hard to find your way around it if you're looking for stuff. Um, it doesn't always come up on their search. The compliance costs we've talked about, it's not only the two billion a year in bureaucracies, but the cost in suboptimal investments has been phenomenal. One of the other things it pretends to do, which is encourage um, new thinking in pension provision, 
and uh, which again wasn't really part of, part of its objectives. But just look at what it costs to get approval of a master trust, which I think is about 70,000 or CDCs. I can't remember what, what it is exactly, but they're charging 70,000 pounds for approval, which makes it hard for smaller enterprises to get something up and running. And as we've seen, um, it's been really hard. And, and, and this reflects what was in the Mansion House speech, which goes 180 degrees against TPR's thinking that pension funds should be doing more interesting things in investments than it has been doing in the past. And the reason we haven't been doing this is because the regulators made it very hard for us to do that. Consolidation we've touched on. I really think consolidation has unintended consequences or will have unintended consequences at some stage. But again, what's it got to do with the regulator as to how people provide their pensions? It may think that it's more efficient to have a few uh, fewer pension schemes and it, it may or may not be. Uh, but it's not a regulator's uh, role uh, to explore that. And one of the things that's really dis uh, unfortunate about regulators, perhaps less with TPR than with FCA, is it imparts a false confidence amongst the users, in other words, members of pension schemes, feel that everything's under control because there's a regulator. And every time we open the FT, we can see there's another failure, regula not failure regulation, but there's been a failure of a company or pension schemes haven't been provided properly, um, despite the existence of regulators. Nearly done, guys. What I really want to spend a couple of minutes on, perhaps we can explore this in discussion, is what we could do with a decent regulator. Uh, and if, the, if, the, we, if we do need a regulator, and we probably need a regulator for political purposes. So I'm not arguing for the complete extinction, although that, that wouldn't be a bad thing. But we're going to have a regulator for the indefinite future. I don't think we need the one we've got. But what we do need is a useful regulator. Uh, and one of the things it could do is provide a safe harbour. And we've seen, for example, in transfers, how difficult it is for pension schemes to, to walk a, a very narrow tightrope, if you can do that, uh, between protecting members uh, and um, giving transfers, which by law they have to do. And this uh, traffic light system is, is rather clunky. Uh, what the regulator could do is just protect pension schemes if they do hand money over at the insistence of members, despite uh, their best uh, endeavours. And what we might also look at is a change of tone in the regulator. This is the second block, which is compassionate regulation. Now, um, one of the things I've been working on recently is the dysfunctionality in something called the General Medical Council, uh, which controls doctors and surgeons in hospitals. Uh, and it's ha been having a pretty bad press over the last four or five years. There's some pretty dreadful things it's been doing. Not uh, worse than what the TPR has been doing, but not far off. And the TPR now has the has the powers that the GMC has to do dreadful things. Um, and uh, I've got one case in particular I've been involved in where it has done something pretty unpleasant. So the question is, can we change the tone regulator? Can we make it compassionate rather than um, controlling? Uh, and GMC is looking at trying, trying to change the tone of its behaviour. Um, in, in other words, if something goes wrong, to try and fix it rather than look for blame. Uh, one of the things that most regulators, most regulatory policy papers are now looking at is changing the culture from a blame culture of regulation to a, an improvement culture which is what the Civil Aviation Authority does, although this is probably not the day to talk about it. <laughs> uh, one of the things uh, that I, <laughs> and I would say this, wouldn't I, um, I find puzzling is that the regulator is obsessed with improving, understandably, uh, pension fund trusteeship and wants them to be qualified or professionalised. <laughs> the one group of people that have no tr proper training in regulation or professionalisation or diplomas or qualifications are the board and senior executive of TPR. Uh, they come on board or they get their position because they're regulators rather than because they know about pensions. And secondly, because, uh, sorry, despite the fact that they don't have any qualifications in regulation. Regulations is an art and a science and a culture and a trade of its own, like being a doctor or a doc dentist or a bus driver. Um, they should be trained. Um, and they're not. And you can see this in the quality of the regulations that's coming out. Uh, I think, oh, and the final point before uh, the final rant, uh, mm -hmm. and I know Julian's on, on the call, uh, is that uh, the rest of us are required to have good governance. I apologise if you can hear a sound noise there, somebody's mowing the lawn in the outside. Um, uh, one of the things that I find very interesting is that we get criticised quite a lot for not being governed as well as we might do, keeping minutes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the pensions regulator continually ignores regulatory governance. There are a lot of guidance notes from government. 
I've just mentioned one amongst maybe a dozen or so points. One is uh, that um, government has a policy of for every rule that comes in, three must go. And if you talk to TPR about this, they just grin and ignore it. Uh, <laughs> and every few months, there's another 100 pages of consultation coming out for new rules and regulations. It's just unacceptable. There should come a time when it's become unacceptable for regulators to keep producing more rules without reducing uh, the overall burden. Final slide. Henry, thank you very much, Henry. And that is, the, the test is this, really. If we got rid of the pension regulator, we would save a couple of billion. We'd save, we'd have created another thousand people to go and do something useful for the country. But would anybody miss it? Uh, and the answer is, well, we can have that discussion. Uh, my feeling is that members wouldn't miss it, employers wouldn't miss it. Uh, the existing control mechanisms, we've got trust law, criminal law, contract law, lots of other rules and regulations, which are already in there in place uh, to protect members. Um, and mostly it works, not perfectly, but it works less imperfectly, I would argue, than TPR does. And I think at the moment TPR is just running on its own tracks. It's justifying its own existence by, by being there. Uh, but every so often we need to dig up the daisies and think about whether or not uh, the existing system needs uh, refreshing, replacing, or even abolishing. Uh, guys, you've been very patient and listened to the rant uh, about interruption. Uh, I think, Steve and Henry, the floor is, is yours. Well, that's that's excellent, Robin. And I, I would speak now for Steve because he's ill. So I, he would normally do this sort of stuff, but I'm, I'm making a mess of it instead. Um, we got a question. Uh, we got two questions. We got one from Ian. I'll come on to you in a second. Uh, we got a question from Michael. Do you want to shoot, Michael? Take yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can I just add to the rant a bit? Um, basically, the usual thing in economics is that um, regulators are taken over by the industry. It seems to me one could make a very good case that the industry in DB pensions has been taken over by the regulator. What I have in mind is the new code, which sort of says, basically, if you take a take the off off the shelf um, arrangement they've got, um, then that's fine. If not, you get investigated and so on. Um, but being off t t t using their uh, off the shelf arrangement uh, really means that you the the um, pension schemes have really given up and they just simply take on board the words of the regulator. So that's another rant, I think. Yeah, and, uh, no, yeah, Michael, I, I take the point. It's called in the trade. We call it regulatory capture, where normally. Uh, the industry moves into the regulator and kind of diminishes the regulator. I agree with you, we've gone the other way. Um, I think, well, I'll let other people chip in before I before I, I give my uh, my response to that. Anybody else want to chip in? Well, we've got a question in the pipeline for me, and so I'll ask that, and then I'll come on to Con. Okay, fire away. Yeah, yeah good morning, Robin. Thank you. Excellent rant indeed. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm more experienced at working in industry regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. And one of the things that they do a lot, particularly around consultations and following the process of consultation before implementation, is that they share good practice, which um, when you were talking earlier about a good culture, I kind of think that's probably one of the best things I like about the FCA because it's, it's kind of helpful. And I just wondered, is the, the comparable, uh, what's your view about how the TPR do that? Because to me, that does feel like a value add from a regulator. Yeah. Yeah. You want to come so, on? Do you want to come back to that one as well, Robin? Yeah, we'll do. OK, I'll, I'll take Thanks, the, thir the third one. Uh, I don't know if you're able to speak for yourself, Connor, whether you want me to read it. Mute, unmute yourself if you want me, if you want to speak for yourself. Uh, I'll speak for myself, Henry. Right, OK. Sorry, no pictures, but uh, you know, very poor um, uh, internet connections where I am at the moment. Um, Robin, the, the question I wanted to ask actually concerns the pension regulator's statutory objective 
to protect the PPF. Why on earth is that given to a regulator to do? Um, such bodies as the PPF exist in many, many other countries, and in none of them is there a regulator or a guardian angel looking after them. Yeah. OK, guys, can I take the three in no particular? Well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll start with cons because um, it's kind of most immediate. Uh, the PP, if you talk to the PPF, uh, which many of us hopefully don't have to do very often, although I, it is my job to do that, um, they say that they don't need protection from uh, TPR. They're, first of all, they've got passive surfaces and the surfaces look to be increasing as we speak. Uh, and secondly of all, they say their internal systems cope very adequately without necessarily having additional controls imposed by TPR on pension schemes. So the PPF feels it doesn't need protection. Uh, the, the TPR does it to justify its own existence. I don't, I'm not trying to be too cynical about the TPR. All, all regulators try and justify their own existence. Um, that's kind of part of what they do. Our job from the industry is to try and manage that. And that comes back to Michael's original point. We as an industry, um, and I got some stick a few weeks ago for an article in Professional Pensions arguing that the PPL, PLSA wasn't really doing its job. Um, we in the industry kind of just take what's given to us by the regulator. And we do that because it's cost effective. It is, it is hugely cost ineffective for us individually to argue with the regulator. Uh, normally, we just take it and run with it. You look at it with chair statements. Chair statements are, are an abomination, really. They're completely pointless. Nobody reads them and they, they don't serve a purpose, but they're very costly to do. And lots of us get fined because the regulator says they're not quite right. We don't push back, as we should do, collectively or collegiately. Now, our trade bodies, I don't think, are doing us. Uh, it's our fault. They're not doing proper service. We should re remonstrate with our trade bodies and say, guys, we can't individually argue with a regulator. We haven't got the time, the money, the resource, the political power, but you do. And we want you to, to tell them to back off where it's not necessary for the protection of members. So that's kind of our fault in a way. And if you look at the value added uh, by regulators, um, the best value added that you can see in the regulatory field and the regulation, there are 300,000 people in the UK employed in regulation at the moment. It's a, it's a gigantic industry. Uh, value added normally comes from kind of good practice and things like that. And I, di I wasn't aware that the FCA were doing this kind of good thing because all I see from uh, my contacts in the FCA is, is not that. But if you're seeing that, that's really encouraging. But the, the, the prime example of, of that is the Civil Aviation Authority, as I mentioned. And when things go wrong, as have gone in the last few days, what they do is they're not looking to find uh, British Airways or wherever it is who runs the, uh, the, um, the airline, um, the air traffic control industry. What they're looking to do is to try and engineer it out. So they get the people in for team biscuits. They have an open discussion. No one's to blame. What they're trying to do is to make your it, it happens in, more infrequently in the future than it's happened in the past. And we need this kind of culture, I think. One of the things I find astonishing and encouraging is how little fraud, apart from scams, by and large, pension funds in the UK, even with Maxwell as, a, as an episode, have been remarkably free from fraud and corruption uh, in the past. And we really, uh, because we've had a trust-based system, which works pretty well, um, and the question is, do we need a regulator on top of the existing protection mechanisms that we've got uh, to help us? And the argument, of course, is that we probably don't anymore. The, the, the regulator was invented as a reaction to a massive uh, scandal, the, the, the Maxwell scandal, which is 30 years ago now. Um, and we've kind of moved on from that. OK, um, does that answer your question, Ian? Are you comfortable con? And, and Michael, do you feel that Robert's consent, um, Robert's consent to your point is sufficient or do you want him to elaborate? No, I'm, I'm happy, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy with the answer there, but I'd ask the question, um, which actually follows on from that, which is the question of a public sector consolidator, which of course is subject hmm. to a call for evidence from the DWP currently should that be within ppf should it be reporting to tpr how should it be structured yeah well um <laughs> you're talking to the wrong guy because i'm a kind of i'm a kind of 
soft libertarian. I don't think it's the job of government, unless there's, unless there's evidence of something really, really wrong, which there isn't. The Tony Blair approach, the Mansion House approach, the DWP, sorry, the Work and Pensions uh, Select Committee approach, is that there are too many pension schemes around and we need to have fewer. And that may be true, uh, but I don't think, I think it's really for the market to decide what it wants. Um, it may be inefficient in a way to have too many motor car manufacturers, but I don't think governments should say there should only be so, so, so many car manufacturers or newspapers or websites or whatever it is, uh, or even government departments. The market, unless there's evidence of, of, of utter abuse and, and um, outrage you know, of, of ill effect on members, it's for the market and employers and people to work out whether they want to join forces or whether they want to run to, to paddle their own canoe. And there's no reason why a small companies shouldn't have smaller pension schemes, big companies have bigger pension schemes, employees and others can decide what they want or not want. Um, if there's something truly dreadful, then obviously uh, the market isn't working, but there isn't evidence of that as far as I can see. And I think everybody should back this. The amount of intellectual effort going into this is astonishing. Um, and it's the only reason I, I can see it is the driver is to consolidate not the pension funds, but the assets. And the big danger of consolidating assets is that you've got a big chunk of money with Nest. You've got a big chunk of money with USS. You've got a big chunk of money with PPF and a big chunk of money with local government. And whether it's Conservative government or Labour government, it's going to be next the next administration. All governments will be looking at this as huge pools of money to control, as they already have done, with, for example, with Royal Mail. So I think the danger may be um, to the other end. But in other words, once you start consolidating, you're looking towards some form of nationalisation of some description. And I think that's a bigger danger than the inefficiencies of smaller schemes. That's uh, very well put. Um, Derek, um, Derek Benstead, of whom I cannot speak too highly, has a question. Derek. Yeah, I've been um, very interested in the remarks that have already been made. Regulators objective to protect members. So Robin suggested the original intention was that the task is to protect members from fraud. Um, the regulator interprets protecting members as demanding ever higher funding and ever more cautious investment, nothing to do with fraud. Um, it also, the regulator seems to interpret its statutory objective of protecting members as meaning protecting past service to the exclusion of future service. Um, I say, or suggest, um, that if, if, if our members are, are to be protected in their retirements, they need pensions as opposed to not having pensions. And therefore, um, the principal task of protecting members is to encourage the provision of pensions as opposed to discouraging it. And therefore, um, if I could venture to suggest some amendments to TPR objectives, then I'd clarify that the protecting members objective includes future service as well as past service. I'd give TPR an objective to increase the numbers of active members in DB schemes or indeed in CDC schemes and abolish their objective of protecting the PPF. Um, I think what happens already sort of has already commented to some extent on protection. I just wondered whether you'd like to discuss further um, the development of TPR's objectives. Yeah. And in particular, my idea of a success criterion in a pension scheme is it's open to new entrants. If it's open to new entrants, you've done something right. If it's close to new entrants or close to accrual, you've done something wrong because you haven't found a way to, to keep the scheme running for the benefit of current and future generations. Yeah, Derek, I'm with you 100%. Um, the only slight um, uh, criticism would be that it's <laughs> that regulators aren't geared up for marketing and, and improving the position of, of industries. That's not what they're about. If anybody is, then it's PLSA or it's analogs. Um, they're kind of trade bodies to try and promote the industry. I, I don't see you could, you could do that. Um, it would be nice if their salaries were <laughs> were paid according to the number of schemes. One of the interesting things, paradoxes really, and, and there's an equivalent, of, I'll just go off piste for a second. Um, there's quite a, in, in regulatory circles, there's quite a famous book in the States about a telecoms regulator. 
they were so efficiently consolidating uh, telecoms companies in the states that they went down from I think twenty five thousand to three hundred, but it kept the same number of staff and OBS and all the rest of it, um, and nobody could see why you needed I know twenty thousand staff to regulate three hundred telecoms companies, um, and one of the things that's interesting with with TPR is. Um, that the number of staff increase as the number of pension schemes diminishes and that, that, gets, that that's just you know unacceptable and there's no there's no 5 10 20 30 year strategy by the regulator in its um its corporate uh, uh statements as to how it sees itself developing over time and that i think's uh, not acceptable for you and me i think we as an industry should expect more from if, if if we still have a tpr which i think we can argue we don't really need it but if we still have it it needs to justify its existence in a better way. There are no metrics for measuring its effectiveness, and it doesn't even try to do that. Um, and there are um, anecdotal, uh, there is anecdotal evidence of which I, I've got many anecdotes uh, of it being dysfunctional. So, Derek, you've got my vote, but I think um, you're too, too optimistic about what a regulator can do. I'm going to move the conversation back to something that you talked about earlier, which is scams and protecting members from them, because I've got quite an interesting email from Margaret Snowden here. Um, and she says, uh, I'd love to have been here, but um, can't. I'm assuming you're not on there, Margaret. No, answer came there, none. Um, I thought I might mention to you, but disappointingly, TPR declined to support p latest scams code version because we're a bit critical of DWP regs, not helpful given all the work by industry to negotiate and draft it, especially as guess what? The pensions minister supports and describes that same volume as essential reading for trustees. Talk about TPR out of step with reality, quote unquote. OK, yeah, well, I've got a slightly idiosyncratic approach. Forgive me for this on scams. Um, and it's, it's born uh, of some experience I had when I was chairman of uh, what is now PLSA, when there was something called animal terrorism, uh, which uh, there were just a dozen or so people causing havoc in the city. And it was fixed um, by us going to see the then Minister for Business, who was a guy called Lord Sainsbury, who was a very effective guy, who in turn had a coffee with Tony Blair, who in turn had a coffee with the Chief Constable of Essex. And within three months, half these guys were in prison and the whole problem disappeared. And it was only because somebody pressed a button to fix it that it was fixed. Now, we have, a, as Margaret says, we've got a growing problem with scams. The, the blame and the controls are being placed on us, which is absurd. We're not a police force. And we have to comply with the other regulations of allowing transfers and all the rest of it. The way to fix, there is a, a thing called Project Bloom, which TPR is a member of. And the TP, Project Bloom has, it's got a new name, I think now, it's TPR, DWP, uh, um, Metropolitan Police, Treasury, uh, maybe a dozen or so public bodies who meet once a quarter for lunch and then disappear off home uh, and instruct uh, some television for some for some television advertising, which doesn't work. The way to fix scams is for TPR to hand over a wad of our cash to the City of London Police, which are probably the best place to deal with this and to go arrest the bad guys uh, and to close down the websites. Nobody does that. Uh, there's, because, because there's a dozen uh, bodies involved in controlling scams, no one's in charge of controlling scams. We need to have one body, and my guess is the City of London Police are the best body, uh, to have responsibility and, and authority and autonomy to fix it, and it will be fixed within a month. Um, at the moment, we're all flailing around and nobody's doing anything about it, and it's very disappointing. And TPR, which is not equipped as a police force, it has prosecutors who don't quite know what they're doing, uh, although they think they do. They love being uh, 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 like Elliot N N Nessing all those years ago in Chicago, um, going arresting bad guys. But actually, they're not equipped to be a prosecutor. Uh, and it's just outrageous. Just a little rant, a side rant, by the way. Um, if you ever get prosecuted by TPO, you'll get prosecuted in a peculiar place, either in Brighton, which very few people live in, uh, especially if you're up in the north of England, or you get prosecuted in some place where allegedly the fraud took place, but you are nowhere near. Uh, and I've been advising some poor guy pro bono, uh, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, who was being prosecuted in Preston when he lives somewhere in the south of England and he has to travel. He doesn't have much money. He had to travel up, rent a hotel and pay for the traveling things, what have you. 
Um, and you think, wh why, why are the prosecution placing peculiar places uh, run by amateurs rather than by professionals, probably in central London, which is the best place for these kind of things? So, yeah, I take the point. Um, OK, so we got a, a question coming on the chat uh, from Keith, Peter Cameron Brown. And look, Peter, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about here. So you better <laughs> ask it directly to uh, to Robin, because then we can get to the bottom of it. Thanks, Peter. If you can. Are you able to come off mute? Still um, I'm, I'm, yeah, right. I'm struggling a bit, so uh, apologies. Um, uh, I was hoping <laughs> that you wouldn't ask me to. Uh, it was really an observation that in you're talking about the inefficiencies to the industry in terms of uh, uh, the pensions members' benefits uh, and use of funds and that sort of thing. Um, and what I sort of recognise is that far too often the pensions regulator is used as a marketing tool from the um, pensions advisory industry who say, uh, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to review this because the pension regulator says this, this is in the code, so you've got to do this exercise. And uh, whether it's relevant to your scheme or not, um, it's very difficult to challenge the, the, the advisor and say, well, you don't really need that. So it was just purely a comment. Yeah, no, I'm with you actually on that. I mean, provided advisors have to do this because if they don't do this, they get criticised for not helping their clients comply. So you've got, you kind of, you know, and I'm, I was a solicitor in practice until very recently, uh, and we had to do that. You go to a client and say, look, you really, the regulator wants this. We think it's a waste of time. Everybody knows it's a waste of time, but you've got to do some box ticking and we can help you do the box ticking. Um, you can see that in ESG. You can do that, see that in, in chair statements, for example, uh, communications, but it's just got to be done. And what regulators never quite understand is what the cost is to you and me. Uh, I remember having served a thing called a Section 72 notice, which is a, a dis, to disclose information. And we'd already said to the regulator through our administrators, whatever information you want, we disclose, even though legally we don't have to do this. Just take whatever you want. And they still served a Section 72 notice. And it cost us, we're a tiny, it was a tiny scheme of about 15 million, uh, 400,000 to respond to it. And the regulator just thought it was going to be three or 4,000. And you just think, this is absurd. They don't understand what's going on. So I'm, again, I'm with you. Um, we're doing a lot of unnecessary work, which is not benefiting members and is costing both employers and members um, in overheads. Could I, could I sort of be the devil's advocate here and actually argue that there are some things that the pension regulators done quite well? Go um, for it. Um, I know this is hard and it comes out, you know, <laughs> but um, actually they did a pretty good job of getting auto enrolment up and running. Uh, so my question is, um, why were why were TPR so good in that area, and why have they been so rubbish in other areas? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, um, <laughs> it's a, it wasn't invented for auto enrolment. Of course, that's number one. Number two, um, it would have been more efficient for T for auto enrolment to be run through HMRC uh, at the time. The HMRC wanted to do it because they were struggling with merging both customs and the revenue at the time, so they had too much on their plate. Uh, but I'm not sure it wouldn't have gone even better uh, if they hadn't been involved. So what they, the, the moment what they do is, is, is prosecute people. And if you look, I, I collect, <laughs> this is like uh, train, train numbers I collect. I collect uh, TPR prosecutions for auto enrolments. And you look at them and you think, poor bloody Mr. Smith out in, uh, you know, up a, up a Staley Bridge or somewhere didn't get the letter or shouldn't and all he wanted all that needed to be done uh, and he feels very um irri he feels um unfairly treated by getting a 400 quid fine it's not the 400 quid it's just it's it's the criticism that he, he's he's breaking the law what he need he didn't realize he was breaking the law he didn't understand he was breaking the law what he needed was a phone call or even a visit from tpr to say look you're not doing what you should be doing you need to do this that and the other and he would have done it and all he's got is a fine and a black mark against his name, which he feels you know, he's been unfairly treated. And uh, so I'm not quite sure I agree with the 100 percent on auto enrolment. Um, it would have happened anyway, whether or not there was a TPR. And the way the TPR do the enforcement at the moment is not in accordance with good regulation. Isn't it sufficiently compassionate? Is that your point? It's insufficiently pragmatic. Compassionate. Yeah, I'll, compassionate. Yeah, I'll take compassionate. And but I'd like to be pragmatic as well. All they had to do was make a. In most of these cases, all they need to do is make a phone call to the chief exec 
who would have fixed it. But they, they, they send letter upon letter, which goes to a wrong post box. Or they should have sent the right address in, it's true, but they didn't. So we all make mistakes. Um, and it's a bureaucratic system, not a, not a, not a pragmatic system. Okay, uh, Bob, Bob Compton's got his hand up. It's always good to hear from you, Bob. Yeah. yeah, hi, Henry. Let me just answer your question. I was heavily involved in the early stage discussions with the DWP on framing what auto enrolment actually was. And I would say that, that auto enrolment was successful because the DWP consulted very widely with the industry, got feedback, listened when the DWP wanted to do things which were um, awkward, difficult or inappropriate or inefficient. People like me were able to say to them, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. Uh, rethink. And they did rethink and they put together a package which actually was implemented and implemented quite well. But a lot of the bureaucracy on auto enrollment in terms of fines, etc., was outsourced in the early days to Capita. So you can't say TPR has done a good job in that regard. <laughs> they just made it worse. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I agree with, with Henry that, you know, even Mussolini made the trains run on time or whatever you want to say. Um, you, know, you can't have an organisation that size that doesn't do occasionally useful things, but mostly, I, 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 mostly it doesn't do useful things. OK, we've got a flurry of hands now. Um, Philip, the reason I haven't come to you so far is because I don't know who you are because you're kind of blind to me. And also, okay. I don't know your second name. So, it's Philip, it. do you want to reveal who you are and, and what your question is? <laughs> Henry, it's Philip Hodges from Guide. Oh, hello, Philip Hodges. Hi, how are you doing? Sorry, Robin, I came in just only like about five minutes ago when you were talking about scams. Um, and I, is it not a very simple, simple answer? Uh, ought trustees to appoint IFAs to the scheme and just make sure they go to a safe place? Yeah, well, the IFA rules, of course, are more, let me, <laughs> don't let me rant about that. But the FCA IFA rules are too complicated as it is. And most IFAs don't want to touch this stuff with a barge bill because whatever they do, they get criticised. I was involved, forgive me, I, I, I declare a lot of interests, but I was involved in something called the Adams case, which you may or may not have come across, where uh, I, I'm, I'm one of the bad guys, where we advised Mr Adams not to do something several times, many times on paper, and he still insisted on doing it. And then, of course, it all went wrong. We get criticised. So, and IFAs have this in spades. Um, yeah, so, but so, I'm sorry, Robin, I've got to pick you up on this. It's still the case. I'm thinking of DB particularly. Yeah. Is like 70% of schemes don't appoint an IFA. They basically say, member, sort yourself out. We don't want to get involved. Yes, and there's, there's a very good reason for that. It's because if it goes wrong, they're... they're they become liable. It, it's a sensitive issue here, and I've got. I take your point, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's a silver bullet. Uh, okay. Because it, it, you know, there are. Other, I'm sorry. There are other answers. There are ways that yes. IFAs do not have. To, sorry, that trustees don't have to overstretch their governance, don't have to take liability, but they can point them to somewhere safe. I'm not going to. Oh, oh I'm yes, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Thank you. All right, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we we're coming back to um, Michael. Michael Bromwich. Yeah, you've got a further and ancillary question. <laughs> you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Well, I find this I find this very refreshing because um, I think it's good to hear these things being aired because if you look at the sort of official uh, replies to consultations and things. Um, there's very little of this sort of leading edge concern. Um, I'm wondering whether the industry really does um, try to uh, push its views onto the regulator or, or whoever's being consulted, because it seems to me there's very much a, yeah, well, I will go along with that sort of approach by the industry. But, but that's I have to say that that's because I'm outside the industry. So I just look at it yeah. a bit and that's my impression. Yeah, well, uh, Julian's on the line, I think, or he's watching, but I think there is a DWP uh, regular uh, review of uh, TPR, which I think one of them is going on as we speak at the moment. But I think it's really to do with its, uh, its efficiency mm -hmm. rather than its 
its purpose, if that makes sense. They're looking at some minor uh, points. And I, I was somebody who, who was not invited to, but did submit evidence. I've not had much response to it. And presumably that report will come out uh, shortly. But I, I, I come again to the point that we as an industry, we as individuals in an industry, we don't pressure our trade bodies enough, in my opinion, um, to come up with alternative systems or better systems than the one we're struggling with at the moment. Um, and I think we're, we're badly served by our representatives. But we do have the opportunity to respond to consultations. And I'm pleased to see that the DWP, unlike the Treasury, don't get wussy when you actually publish your <laughs> consultation response. I didn't the, know the Treasury's Treasury standard thing is we're not going to consider your response because you made it public. Yeah. Like, what in heaven's name is that about? So, yeah, hats off. I would also say, in defense of uh, uh, TPR, I'm, I'm now not I'm getting close to liking them. I'm, 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 <laughs> But they sure. do have they do have a wish to change, or so they say. So I, I'll ask the question of Robert. What do you make of Norska Delfas's um, stated intention to have a a new paradigm, a a new attitude towards regulation? Is this is this simply a new uh, chief executive trying to uh, exert control, or is do you think that's a uh, Henry, as ever? You've, you've asked a really good point. I think most of us who had dealings with senior officials at, D at TPR are quite impressed with the quality of the people there. They seem to be open minded and open to debate and discussion and review and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it doesn't seem to percolate down through to middle and junior management. So when you actually come across them in real life, in the heat of the battle, as it were, the actual day to day approach of TPR is quite aggressive and confrontational and unhelpful. If you talk to senior people, then you get a different picture. But what is not happening is that that senior approach, that broad minded, pragmatic approach is not percolating down to day to day officials. Now, whether that's to do with the caliber of people, whether that's to do with poor communications, whether that's to do with too big or not, I don't know what the reason is, but it's not changed in 10 or 15 years. Um, so I wish Nozika every success in, in changing the culture. And I know Sarah Smart, when she became chairman, wanted to change the culture. But at the moment, there's not much evidence of it. OK, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, because you're closer to the coal face than I am, Robin. Uh, has anyone else got any comments they want to make on the back of that? Because I think it's, it really gets to the nub of it. Are the pension, is the pension regulator looking to change to get its act together? Or is it stuck because it can't change the vast uh, body of those thousand people mm. down in Brighton. Deadly ah, harsh. Deadly harsh. Although Mr. Keating has come up with a couple of um, and then there's a question. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got something from Martin as well, so I'll come back to that in a second. But um, have the TPR abandoned the proposed funding code? That was the high point of the old mindsets. Do you, do you think it's do you think it's gone, Robin? Do you think the funding code? No, I, I don't. I don't know what's going on in CPR. I think they've had a bit of a shock from the Mansion House speech, and they're going to have to yeah. rethink uh, their their deep found convictions, which they've had for a decade or more, but about how pension funds should invest, and that's come, come as a bit of a shock. But I can't imagine uh, that they're going to relinquish something which has been part of their DNA for so long. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, apologies to Shay, because there's a comment which goes back uh, some minutes, but I'll, I'll come on to that. Hi, Robin. I was wondering whether you had any observations on the level of the skills and expertise within TPR <laughs> to meet their statutory <laughs> objectives. Have they got it in on? Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's, it comes back to the point I made earlier. And um, I'm working with PMI. This is kind of off the record, not for general public consumption, but we're working with the PMI to try and organize some kind of basic diplo postgraduate diploma in training for regulators, not just TPR regulators, but all regulators. Um, so they understand principles of, ration, of proportionality and uh, effectiveness and tone and all, the, all those good things that you and I know uh, about how to be a good regulator, but they don't seem to have in their, in their fabric. Um, and I think over the next five or 10 years, if regulators can be persuaded to, quali to train their staff better, uh, we might get a better quality of regulation and less of it, but better. Uh, and I think there is a hope that we can do that. Uh, but at the moment, it's unfair to expect junior staff to do what they're doing 
without them. I just to, I'll just give you a quick idea, and I know we need to come to an end. Um, some years ago, when when um, when tab, uh, you know, kind of Apple tablets came out, iPads and things, I bought one from the Apple store, and I live in a house which has stone floors. And after a week or so, I dropped it on the stone floor, and the screen shattered. My own fault, not insured. Don't blame anybody else. I went to the Apple store and said, look, is this fixable or not? And an 18 year old sales assistant. Said, no, it's not fixable. Here's a new one. She was authorized <laughs> to make a decision to spend the thick end of a thousand quid on her own gut feeling. And I thought, forget what the quality of the products they have. But what they had done was empowered their team to make practical decisions, which made me a customer of Apple, of Apple for life. And what they've done was empower their junior staff. And I don't see that happening, for example, in the regulator. I don't see them empowering their staff to make practical, sensible, day to day empowerment of their decisions. And that, I think, is a shame. Yeah, and a uh, great comment from Derek in the, uh, to, to the event that what you tend to get from TPR is sort of unhelpful letters um, in, in the chat. Um, I, I'm going to finally sort of come to Martin's point. Well, Martin, do you want to make it yourself? Sorry, Sherry, for not allowing you to make uh, uh, your your point. Uh, you will forgive me. Um, Martin, uh, this oh. was being now. Yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I mean, it was just to say, I, I think it's been a really interesting talk. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I think it would be um, fascinating, given that there has been change at the top at TPR and DWP, it would be really interesting to have a, 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 a round table discussion that might be behind closed doors as to what the direction of travel on TPR should be. Um, I mean, I've, I've spoken to uh, David Fares a couple of times in his old role and bumped into him in his new as well. And um, yeah, very you know pragmatic guy when you speak to him, but that's not what you get from TPR's coalface. And it would be great to hear a, a, about a direction of travel moving away from this continual herding towards so-called low risk. Yeah, well, we, we've got a sort of standing invitation to Nausicaa to come uh, to uh, one of these coffee mornings. I'll renew it. I'll say there's been renewed calls for her to come along. Mm -hmm. I think she's she's the person. Margaret is a marvellous person to have on these calls. She used to be a pension regulator, non-exec. Robin obviously has bundles of experience. David, as you rightly say, um, is um, a former director of policy. So there's all kinds of good reasons to have that. We'll try and get it up and running as soon as possible. Martin, and that will be fun. Um, we, we are coming to the end of our um, 90 min of our 60 minutes. And as Robin said, it's not enough. But um, I'd, I'd like to allow the great man himself to have a chance to wrap things up before we... <laughs> Before we say goodbye. Uh, that's so, very kind. Comments, well, I, don't, I don't want to really add anything to I mean, we've, we've had a bit of a discussion about it. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's, who's chipped in and made observations and so forth. And it's clear that as a, as a group, we're not comfortable with the existing situation. We're not quite sure what would be better, but um, we need to kind of use our such resources as we have and such contacts as we have to keep this debate going, I think. Um, and hopefully we'll get a better outcome um, in the next few years. Thank you, everybody. And anything you said won't be taken away and used in evidence against you. It is Chatham House, even at TPR, right? So there we go. Um, thank you very much indeed. Steve, you've come back on. Do you want to sort of give us a quick uh, quick announcement of what's going yeah. on? No, no, I just wanted to say thanks everybody for joining today. Thank you especially to Robin for his fantastic presentation. Uh, it's uh, definitely an ongoing uh, discussion, debate, uh, and we've got some powerful people on Playpen that can push a few buttons um, in the, with the right people, I guess. So um, Robin, if you could stay on for uh, a few minutes, that'd be great. Um, and thanks everybody for, uh, for, for joining today. The video will be up later on this afternoon. And uh, if anybody wants a copy of the slides, then please email myself or Henry Tapper. That'd be fantastic. Uh, next week, we'll be in conversation with um, somebody else. Uh, I haven't quite decided who that's going to be. <laughs> But uh, we've got a slot next week and uh, we'll either continue this theme or various other themes. But uh, yeah, really appreciate your support of Playpen uh, and hope you enjoyed the session. And um, I wish everybody a really uh, good um, end of the day and good week. Uh, and as we usually say, let's pray for peace in the East, even, yeah. even now.
end of August, Peace in the East. So there we are. Uh, but Robin, fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. And thanks to everybody for attending. Sorry um, to the people but... we didn't get to, to Andy. Andy Agafangler, lovely to see you on the call, Andy. Sorry we haven't got to you. Uh, yeah. And uh, thanks to, as I say, everyone for it. Let's, let's uh, all have a great day. Uh, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Thank thanks you. everybody for their questions. Yeah. All right. Okay. Take care. Thanks yes, very much. Fine. Bugger off, everyone. Fine. <laughs> Thanks, Henry. <laughs> um, yeah, Robin, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask a question, a personal question, sure. because uh, I've got experience, obviously, like Ian was saying, with the FCA. Um, the FCA have, for, for a number of years, had a practitioners panel, um, yeah. some sort of mediation or, you know, a middle ground between, um, you know, the advisors who don't want to put their head above the trench and get it shot off. Um, versus, you know, what sort of services the FCA giving. Um, is there an equivalent in some part of the regulator of a practitioner's panel to say, you know, uh, this is a group of a collective where change could be made or improvements could be made and this is genuine feedback or do you think it's a bad idea? I think it's a very good idea. They did have occasional ad hoc um, user groups which have kind of, I think, been discontinued for the last four or five years. And they do have, it runs like a Zimbabwean general election. They every year ring me and lots of other people up to find out what our views are of TPR. Mm. And I can't be the only one that's critical. And it comes back a 98% approval rating. <laughs> you think, guys, <laughs> <laughs> come on, you know. Come and on, speak, it can't I, be that all the day. It can't be that. Right. So I'm not sure quite how to handle it, but I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I was wandering the streets of the city uh, about a year ago and Sarah Smart was walking the other direction. She crossed the road and said, look. And I said, what's that? And she pulled a wadge of papers out of her bag and she said, this is the bri briefing pack for our next mm -hmm. CEO. Charles just announced he was going. And I said, what's in it? And she said, there's four of your blogs. Oh, very good. So oh. I, I was impressed by that. Yeah. And I mean, Clearly, that that does yeah. This, Didn't this, work though, did it, Henry? <laughs> well, yeah. They'd, they'd were... only chosen five, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I know they look at my blogs as well, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. They they just think we're mavericks and and kind of out you know out with the industry, and we would say this, wouldn't we? This is the Mandy Rice Davis thing. Yeah, um, the, the, the the awkward squads. But yeah. uh, there was first forty odd people, more than that. How many do we have on the call today, Phil? Uh, I think 40, 41, I think, was the most we had, which yeah, is great. It's, it's, Absolutely yeah. fantastic for a holiday season and yeah. a day after bank holiday. It's a and great you, and you session. To, and you have to pay to get on the website. Bloody hell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> things, are, things are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Right. Are they, is anyone actually paying any money? Still? Yeah, yeah, we are getting we are getting subs in and stuff. It is so wait, just, to, just to waste your time for two minutes. I don't know. I, I went out to lunch with Sarah Smart a year or two back. And yeah. she was accompanied by a henchwoman who was kind of making sure she didn't say anything, a deep, you know, a, yeah. a, a kind of a, a regulatory advisor. Anyway, I got a, a chaperone, bollocking, yeah. A, a chaperone, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I got a complete bollocking because I used the word. She said, what are you doing? That? I said, well, I'm chairman of a couple of schemes. She went berserk. You can't use the word chairman. It's chairman. I thought, well, I apologize. Anyway, that's by the by. And then I see uh, there's quite a funny debate, I think, in the Times somewhere in the last couple of days about lionesses. Have you seen the... Um, the foot the uh english women's football team yeah oh yeah and they call yeah. themselves lionesses and th there's a debate about whether that's appropriate in modern circumstances whether the, because actresses are now called actors for yeah. example we don't we don't use sexual discriminate with uh, allocation for various uh, trades and should use it for footballers anyway i haven't started that debate with her yet but uh, yeah I'm so sure just can't. lions. It should, it should, should be, be lions. lions. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, if I was a lion, the world's I... going mad. The world is actually going mad. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, anyway, yes, Steve, yes, well yes, done yes, with yes, the great yes, thing. I hope, hope it's going well. I know it's you know. Well, no, we, we, it seems to be going well. It seems to be yeah. keeping a a healthy level of interest up, and it's nice to see people like Julian coming along. Yeah, very open-minded bloke. Clearly, hasn't got any work to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's got a very nice uh, I, used to, I used to be a motorcyclist and he's got a wonderful motorbike which i kind of envy what's, it, what's he got i can't remember he did tell me it's a it's a pretty powerful bike um, okay so yeah. Yeah, yeah he's a good fellow Jimmy. yeah good stuff um okay so okay, uh, all that all, all that was great and lovely lovely to see you robin thank you so much oh, thank you guys much appreciated anything else steve 
No, I was just going to say, Robin, thank you very much indeed. I really, really appreciate that. Um, you know, if you wanted to, uh, what, we, what sometimes we do is um, we do a one minute summary at the very end because we'll post it on LinkedIn. Yeah. And again, this is your um, sort of bit to sort of promote you, I guess, and and promote the theme. Um, but in one minute, how would you summarize today, bearing in mind, uh, you know, it'll go out on LinkedIn? Um, what would you what would you say? Yeah, that's that's probably what I'd, I'd well, ask. I think. I think the industry, I think I think what came out of the discussion was that the industry, and it may not be a representative group, but that's always a problem. Um, but there is some concern about the, both the expense and the intervention and the unintended consequences of what TPR is doing. I don't think uh, it's personal to individuals, but I think there is an issue, a policy issue about what kind of regulator we want. And I think my guess is there's a consensus the, 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 that the existing regulatory framework is inappropriate and excessive. Uh, we need to rethink um, what kind of regulator we want, if any, and uh, we need the industry to, to come together to articulate its views rather than do it as individuals. And what would be a good first step on, on along that road? Well, I was hoping that the um, PLSA would would get up his, his behind and articulate that but at the moment it thinks it's better politics to work with TPR rather than to rethink TPR and I think personally that's a mistake whether pension playpen could uh, could operate as a pressure group or um, a lobbying group or a, a think tank group I don't know but um, s some group needs to do it you can't yep. do it. we can't do it as individual pension schemes that's not doable yeah I understand yeah okay um, and I know Henry's got a an in with Nausicaa, I guess. Um, I think there is an open invitation. And actually, why not have a open yeah. panel discussion with her and just say, Good idea. you know, let's, uh, let's, you know. Well, I'm, I'm due to have lunch with her in, in three or four weeks time. So, well, uh, maybe if you mention it as well, then, we'll you, know, do, we, yeah. we, we, you know, I think it would be an enjoyable session. It's, I don't think it would be uh, destructive. I think it would be no, constructive. No, we don't. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, well, according and, to Henry, she's, she's quite a positive person. So, well, there you go. There you yeah. go. So uh, okay. we're, we're thinking along the lane, same lines, yeah. which is great. Um, Robin, Thanks. thank you so much. Really appreciate your time today. Absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, really appreciate your input. And let's uh, let's talk again on the subject. Yeah, brilliant. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks All a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.